I started with TD because it, it, it explained beamforming in a much more sort of tangible manner. Um, so people like Sprint and other operators in the world um, have 8T8R for TDLT. This is in the um, band 41, 2500 uh, megahertz. Uh, by applying pre-coding phasing across the, um, each column uh, of, uh, of antenna arrays, you create this, this, oops, this, um, this directional beam, okay? And that's directed towards the user on its resource box being served. So it's a per user resolution of beam forming, okay? I get some extra gain, and I, I can also be mindful of the intersector interference I create. This is the, this area beyond the two dark lines at the top line. Um, if I move that to two columns instead of four columns, so 44, I create a more crude beam shape, but nonetheless it's still directive. Um, but you can play about with the, the separation. Now in theory, in the textbook, say 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 lambda is sort of ideal for scanning a beam around. Okay, you get good gain and you get good intersector interference or minimum. If I keep increasing that, um, you can actually find yourself suboptimal. So I'm going to come, come on to so one lambda. Um, I get a slightly narrow beam and I start popping up some side lobes. It's a, sort of laws of physics for, for beam forming. Um, and I can increase that. Um, what about 1.4, 1.6, 2 lambda? Uh, and this is what we explored. Um, so let's talk about FDD. So TDD has this nice animation that can apply arbitrary beam forming weights across the, uh, the columns. With FDD, um, you don't have that, you have something called, you use code books for free coding. So you end up with defined patterns of beam forming. So um, at the bottom here, I'm showing what would be um, code book zero. Find the base station antenna with two columns. I'm talking to someone at the back of the site. Um, they would receive a beam, their information pre-coded by pre uh, code book zero, which gives that beam pattern. Okay? If I did that with slightly wider antennas, I'd get um, this picture. A slightly wider again, picture in the bottom right. Um, if I'm serving users at different angles away from me, I might create these patterns. Okay? But if I look at all patterns for all directions for all the users in a homogeneous kind of network, I can then look at, well, what's my contribution to intersect interference? So, um, this component here, which I've marked with the arrow, intersect interference, I can't point, sorry. Um, that creates interference. It's inadvertent interference which you cause by the virtue of beam forming in the wanted cell. And if you add it all up to you can actually find that there's half lambda is the, the optimal. That's what the textbooks tell you or should be beam forming at. Um, something about 1.1, 1.2 lambda is kind of suboptimal. What I'm drawing here is on the x, the wavelength separation, and on the y, the, the amount of interference I inject in the, into the neighboring cells in azimuth. Okay, and that's a three sector kind of configuration. Um, but interestingly, we found that by increasing the, the separation a little bit more, you, you can come back to a, a, an optimal case. You end up creating the grading loads in the wanted sector, which of course isn't interference, um, they're not contributing to the um, interference out of sector. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate at the top. Uh, and again, that's just for the Borsite case. You can see on the 1.6 lambda, for example, separation, you, all the energy for the intended user falls in the cell. Very little falls outside. Okay? And in fact, the Borsite direction is the more common pre-coding uh, scenario. Um, so there's been lots of studies looking at half lambda, three lambda, ten lambda, very sort of crude steps. We took it a little bit further and looked at um, how do they vary sort of um, as you go in a more granular manner. 